The American Law Institute is producing an audiovisual history of persons active in its affairs over the years. Today, we shall be interviewing Professor Homer Kripke. Professor Kripke served as associate reporter for the Review Committee on Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code from 1967 to 1971, and as a consultant on the American Law Institute Federal Securities Code from 1971 to 1978. He is now an emeritus member of the Permanent Editorial Board of the Uniform Commercial Code. I interviewed Professor Kripke on September 8, 1989. I did some research on your background, Homer. I understand you got your JD at Michigan 1933. Right. Michigan Law Review? I was on the Law Review. In, in those days, the Michigan Law Review was a faculty-run review, so there weren't any president or, or note editors or the like. Uh -huh. I, I was on it both in my junior year and in the senior year as one of four advisors to the juniors on the faculty, on the review. That's the nearest they came to having any officers. I was the top man in my class. And then you went to private practice for you, for 33 to 38, according to who's who? Yes. In Chicago and New York? In Chicago. Uh, originally in Toledo, Ohio, my hometown, for six months, and then in Chicago. I went from there to the SEC. Where you were until 1944, I take it, and then Assistant General Counsel, CIT Financial Corporation. Right. So 1960, private practice again, and back to Allied Concord Finance Corp. Financial Corp. Financial Corp. Uh, until 66, and then... That 60 date is wrong. I think it's 61. 61. And from there you went to NYU. That's right. Where you were a professor and became Professor Emeritus in 81, then a distinguished professor in San Diego. You're also a member of the National... Member of Emeritus National Bankruptcy Conference. And with that background, we come to the... Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, how did that area of the law become your area of expertise? Well, when I, when I left the SEC, I had been Assistant General Counsel. I had argued some of the great cases, but I had been in charge of appellate litigation at the SEC for about three, three years. I had argued the first cases on the famous death sentence under the Public Utility Holding Company Act and some other uh, important leading cases. And I didn't mean to demean myself by going from there uh, to just a money-grubbing organization. I talked to Henry Friendly, who was not yet a judge, but was a senior partner of the firm of Cleary, Godley, Friendly, and uh, later Hamilton. Originally there was some other name instead of Hamilton. Uh, and he told me that he thought CIT was an excellent organization uh, with excellent financial people. And talking to the person who was becoming general counsel and who hired me, I got the picture uh, which I have always entertained and which I mentioned in my a lecture yesterday that here was the process of distributing our enormous outpouring of goods and that it took a lot of financing and the banks had not seen either the need or the opportunity and were leaving it to organizations like CIT. CIT was then uh, the leading uh, independent organization in the field. Of course, there was General Motors Acceptance Corporation owned by General Motors, limiting itself to General Motors uh, financing uh, exclusively. There was a General Electric 
credit corporation uh, limiting itself to products uh, which General Electric uh, Motors or the like were at least important parts. There was similarly a Westinghouse company. There was Commercial Credit, CIT's biggest work rival, Associates Finance, which was a smaller rival. But CIT uh, was the biggest independent and it was extremely prosperous at that time, so much so that there was at least one year in which CIT made more money than any bank in the country. Uh, the banks, as I said, were missing a great opportunity. Uh, not only that, but CIT recognized that the business depended on building a body of law that would be useful. Uh, uh, it, the remarkable thing about General Motors' acceptance, the biggest company, is that it had no lawyers. It had a couple people with law degrees who functioned as uh, political people keeping an eye on legislatures, uh, but it had no lawyers. It sort of depended on CIT to uh, take care of the law. Commercial credit had no lawyers in its employment, but it did have uh, law firms in both uh, New York and Baltimore, which primarily did commercial credit work. Uh, when their senior partner, Mr. Dills, died, one of their most important ablest men, Jack Levinson, left commercial credit and came to CIT, strengthening our legal department. So we were busily engaged in consciously developing the law of the field uh, when other co companies like General Motors and General Electric uh, literally did not understand that this was necessary. So how did you get involved with... Uh, Pardon me? How did you become involved with uh, UCC? With Carl Llewellyn and the ALI and the commissioners? Yes, well... Uh, I had uh, been told by the fellow who was primarily keeping an eye on the development of the law that there was a uniform commercial code in process and did I have any pet provisions I'd like to try to get in it and I ignored that, I didn't have any. Uh, and then Milton P. Kupfer of New York, who was the first general counsel of, a comp of an organization whose present name is National Finance, National uh, Commercial Finance Association. Its prior names I've forgotten. Uh, went to an American Bar Association meeting in Seattle in 1948, followed by uh, a meeting of the commissioners on uniform state laws, and he brought back the first published draft of uh, a chapter in our field of secured credit. It was a chapter on inventory, and he sent it to me. I read it, and uh, Carl Llewellyn uh, had, who was the chief reporter of the code, had used the expression in an article in 1948, inventory in the broader sense, including accounts receivable, uh, and I hadn't thought much of that. I'll come back to Llewellyn's earlier exploration in this field in a moment. Uh, I hadn't thought much about that because he had recognized in the earlier law the close relationship between inventory and the accounts or other receivables arising from sale of inventory. So that remark was not exceptional. But in his draft, he defined inventory to include accounts receivable. Having written the draft, he forgot about his definition. The treatment of inventory uh, was an excellent first draft, 
uh, and translated into understandable English uh, an excellent statute he had written in the field before uh, the Uniform Trust Receipts Act, uh, which was usable but ununderstandable, as I'll explain in a minute. Uh, and this time he wrote a reasonable, good first draft of inventory, but when you look, remembered the definition and applied it to accounts, it gave you nightmares because inventory is primarily a two-person relationship, a dealer and merchandise and a lender. Uh, and accounts receivable is a three-party relationship, a seller and a buyer, and uh, a third party who takes over the credit obligation from the seller. And since he had totally ignored his definition, this, statute, this draft gave me nightmares. I didn't know whether one dared approach the famous Carl Llewellyn, uh, but Allison Dunham I knew was working with him, and I knew Allison Dunham because we both lived in Westchester, New York, and uh, we had met socially. And so I asked Allison whether Llewellyn would talk to me. He said yes. I called Llewellyn. He invited me out, and uh, he agreed readily that his the uh, draft uh, had to be changed because of that definition, and then he started talking generally. Uh, he said that uh, he knew that he had no uh, touch feel for these problems in what we now call asset-based financing, although that is a fairly new term. Uh, and he had tried to get the feel of it by talking to the banks. And then he quoted to me uh, what I will try to repeat the way he said it. The banks told him, we don't know anything about chattel mortgages and that kind of stuff. Uh, we only deal with persons who come well recommended. And he said that the banks gave me no help. And uh, fortunately, and there was a fellow at CIT named Harold F. Birnbaum, uh, whom he had known and who had uh, been very helpful to him in understanding this business realistically. Fortu unfortunately for him, uh, fortunately for me, uh, Harold F. Birnbaum had left CIT because he didn't get the general counselship and had gone to uh, Los Angeles to practice law and I was his successor, so it was just natural for uh, Llewellyn uh, to attach himself uh, to me as uh, someone who could give him guidance in the realistic application of this business. That was in 1948, and I've been working on the code a substantial part of my time ever since. Just then, as an aside, Harold F. Birnbaum is still alive. A living retired in Hawaii. He must be about 92 years old. His mind is still excellent. Uh, I came to know him when we were both working on the code together. Uh, he's always anxious to be briefed on anything that's going on, and uh, he made some very valuable suggestions on Article 9, which are reflected in Section 9103. Harold is a member of the Institute, yes. and he each year when we sent out the annual meeting drafts, we received a note or two from him commenting on what might be done. I saw him in Hawaii several years ago. I didn't realize he was now 92. The, his handwritten notes come talking about suggestions, how to improve a draft. 92 is just my guess as to his date, but he is certainly uh, in his 90s or 89 or something like that. Uh, was Allison Dunham the reporter at the time for Article 9? Uh, or was Allison Dunham and Grant Gilmore were co-reporters for Article 9. Uh, not very long afterwards, before I got very deeply into it, uh, Dunham, who had been chosen because he was uh, basically a real property lawyer, 
decided that there was no uh, similarity between the law of real property and this field of law and withdrew from uh, Llewellyn's team. That left Gilmore as his drafting assistant on Article 9. Now, Gilmore had been a teacher of French. He went to law school and became a professor of law. Uh, the field, I think he has described this, this himself somewhere, uh, the fields that he was to teach were originally unknown, uh, and he got assigned to teaching uh, personal property law, and that's how Llewellyn picked him up. Uh, when I saw him uh, first, which was either that first time I went over or my next trip, uh, he had a new draft of the chapter on inventory, and it looked pretty good, but it wasn't complete and it wasn't perfect by any means, and Llewellyn sent him back uh, for a redraft. Uh, I might mention that his theory was, that their theory was, that they would have separate, separate chapters on inventory financing, accounts receivable financing, consumer goods financing, and so on. As these separate drafts progressed, it became apparent that there was a lot of duplication in them and that the proper structure was not by types of goods uh, but, or types of transactions, but by <coughs> basic uh, aspects of a securities transaction, such as the making of the agreement, the perfection, uh, the rights of third parties, and so on. <coughs> and <coughs> the structure of Article 9 gradually evolved to what it presently is. Uh, Saya Llewellyn was, of course, the associate chief reporter, and Carl had very great respect for her. Saya was suspicious of anybody from the finance industry from the start, <coughs> and when the New York City Bar uh, began to organize to deal with the code, and Charlie Willard uh, was the first chairman of a committee, and I showed up at the organization meeting of the committee. Uh, Charlie Willard told him that Soya had instructed him not to let the finance companies capture the committee, and I was excluded from that committee. It wasn't till later that Soya recognized I was trying to do my best, and as she and Grant both subsequently said in written documents, uh, I always knew whether I was representing my client in the industry and with, when I was acting pro bono, and I left no doubt with them if I was ever representing the industry that I was doing so in that particular time. So I got along fine after that with them. Was Sawyer on Article 9 from the beginning when you when you started? Well, I think Sawyer was a floating a floating halfback. He was on everything. <clears throat> the chemistry among the, all of you must have been very interesting. Carl was, to Carl say the least, top, and he was until he got began to get ill. He was very active in it, and. Uh, we would talk about these problems together. Later, as he got ill, uh, Soya <coughs> uh, became his executive assistant, and Grant and I and Jerry Ireton of Commercial Credit, <coughs> Milton Kupfer to a limited extent, although I think he never <coughs> got beyond representing his industry. Uh, uh, would kick, kick these problems around. And so we ultimately produced uh, that part of article, that first 
a version of Article 9 which was embodied in the code. I should say we had a lot of trouble with it. We soon recognized the proceeds problem and the priorities problem resulting from it. <coughs> and we tried to solve it. We never could solve it. I sort of hoped <coughs> that we could perfect a code and do what has recently been suggested say that uh, adopting states for in adopting states it will become effective five years from now and in the meantime I and others working in the field would try to apply it to pending uh, uh, developments and see if it worked right so that of course was impossible they had a problem with budget and uh, Mr. Schneider and Judge Goodrich uh, were very anxious uh, to finish the code because they had not only budgetary problems but maintaining the interest of the advisory committees and all the chapters. Uh, so at one point when I was puzzled by something, I told Schneider that Article 9 was not yet ready. We had to go through at least another draft. He said, well, we've got to get this thing out, Article 9 is not yet ready, we'll drop it. But fortunately, it didn't happen uh, that way because uh, I think undoubtedly, uh, while the other chapters are highly meritorious, the novelty and coordination achieved by Article 9 as against the fragmentary uh, diverse laws in the field uh, has been the greatest achievement of the code. I, I have your, I understand there was a committee to review, a subcommittee to review Article 9 before the 1958 edition. And you mentioned uh, Arden, he was the chairman of that, and the other names on there I have here is yourself, Tony Felix, Peter Coogan, Grant Gilmore, and then Harold Birnbaum and Richard Walters. Remember that subcommittee that reviewed Article 9 before the 58 edition? before the 58th edition. That was after the New York uh, uh, Law Revision Commission had come out with its report. <coughs> I don't remember much about that. Uh, I don't remember who Richard Wallace was. Walters, Richard Walters. I don't remember him either. And I, of course, the other name. When, when did Peter Coogan? Oh, yes, I, I, I meant to tell that story. I can't give you a definitive date, but Walter Malcolm of Boston uh, had come into the discussions at an early date and was a frequent speaker on the background of the code. I don't think he got down into the nuts and bolts of Article 9 very much, but he was a strong supporter of the code. Then one day, uh, fairly early in the game, uh, as early perhaps as uh, 19, let's see, the code was adopted in Massachusetts in 1954, and, and I mean Pennsylvania, effective 54. This must have been as early as 52. Uh, Walter Malcolm invited Carl and me uh, to meet at the Association of the Bar of the City of New York on 44th Street with Peter Coogan, whom he brought along. Now, Peter and he were, in effect, rivals, uh, or their law firms were rivals for the business of the First National Bank of Boston. But they were very good friends together. Peter was a very adventurous, a uh, lawyer in asset-based financing, uh, doing uh, innovative financing on moving pictures, television, which was just then beginning, for an advent very adventurous uh, vice president of the bank whose name slips me. Yeah. Is that the Russian name? Who? It was a Russian? The, uh, yes. 
I don't remember his name, but I remember Peter talking about it. Uh, the name will come to me. Uh, and Peter came to us and said in substance, I have an enormous problem. <coughs> finding any firm guidance as to what I have to do to perfect uh, Ian, or what we now call a security interest, on some of the intangible assets uh, which are my security in moving picture or television uh, financing. In the beginning, all I have is the contracts of the producer and the director and the star and other actors and the rights to the story, all of which are intangible. And when I'm all through, all I have is a can of film, which in itself is worthless. It's the product uh, that is valuable. And we just don't know what we have to do uh, to give us a firm legal hold is what we now call a security interest on them. They don't fit into any normal categories. They don't fit into your categories in your drafts of accounts receivable or, or uh, equipment or uh, as consumer goods or the like. They don't fit as notes uh, or chattel paper. But what you need is some catch-all for this kind of valuable intangible. And so we concocted the name General Intangibles, put it in the code, provided for filing to perfect it, and give Peter a firm hold in the future. And Peter became a loyal supporter of the code, the hardest worker, uh, the most productive writer, and the best technician. Uh, and he and Walter Malcolm put the code through in Massachusetts in 57 or 1958 uh, when it had faltered with no enactments other than Pennsylvania uh, since a 1952 enactment. And I think the two of them saved the code Peter was a very vigorous worker there, became the great star of the code, and as you know, uh, published and maintained a book which grew to four volumes on the code. Walter Malcolm was a pretty take-charge person. I remember he used to drive Judge Goodrich wild with trying to take over and run the project. Goodrich would tell me that he doesn't know how he's going to cope with Walter and just wants to run away with the ball. Well, uh, that was good because, frankly, uh, some of us used to say uh, Goodrich and uh, Schneider were running around making speeches about this being a superlative code, and we sometimes wondered whether they had ever read it. Uh, <laughs> it had to be slowed down until the technical knots were gotten out. Uh, and let me tell you a story there. Uh, there was a fellow who drafted Article 6 named Charlie Bunn. He was a professor at the University of Wisconsin, I think. I didn't really know him, but I saw him presenting Article 9. And he uh, explained at one stage, I mean Article 6, he explained at one stage uh, there are two <coughs> present uh, types of bulk sales laws. One is the New York model in which the buyer does not have to see to the application of the proceeds of a bulk sale. And the other is the Pennsylvania model in which the buyer has to see to the application and if he doesn't he's going to be liable. And most of the states have the New York model but about 17 or 19 have the Pennsylvania model, and naturally up goes the hand. Uh, which one does the uh, reporter recommend? And Bunn puts up his hand like this. 
obvious. He never anticipated the question or knew what he was going to answer. Well, that formed my judgment on Bunn. Then as the Article VI worked toward final form, some matter arose. I don't, can't remember what the detail was, but I was convinced that Bunn had a, an error in his draft, so I wrote him about it. I never got an answer, but the next draft had the same answer, so I wrote him again. The next draft had the same error, and I wrote him a third time. This time I did get an answer, but it came not from Bunn, but from Judge Goodrich. And what he said was a paraphrase of uh, a sentence that is connected with Oliver Cromwell. I looked this up once, and I can't remember whether Cromwell said it or whether somebody said it to him. But what Goodrich said to me was, Homer, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ to bethink yourself that you might be mistaken. <laughs> Goodrich is great on these quotes. I remember when I was his law clerk, and uh, he would turn out an opinion with great dispatch. And uh, some of the other judges were considerably slower, especially the chief judge. And it would exasperate Goodrich, and he would say, God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested, and it shouldn't take any longer to write an opinion. <laughs> and he stuck to that. You mentioned Schneider several times. Uh, he, he was uh, he wrote Hurd on the code all the way through. It. That was, I think, his... He, he said he what? He wrote Hurd on getting it he through. He wrote Hurd to get completed. I, uh, as I said, I, I, he never volunteered any substantive comment, either good or bad, or said, you missed this, or I've had this problem and I don't see that you handled it. Nothing like that. But he was concerned with getting it enacted. That was his uh, problem. And as I said, uh, uh, if we weren't ready to go, he was going to drop out Article 9 and go ahead with what he had. Uh, and once he had some enactments and the problem arose of completing them, uh, he was furious uh, to have people known as, the, uh, as those who had drafted the code, criticizing it and suggesting that it was imperfect because that just multiplied his problems in uh, getting it enacted in the remaining states. The three biggest offenders were Coogan, uh, Gilmore, and I. Uh, Remember Dunham, too. He, he was quite upset with Dunham one time. Well, Dunham had, he may have been, but Dunham dropped out very early in my contract. Uh, I know that Dunham wrote some articles on the code. It, Back to 1948. Absolutely infuriated, Schneider. Yeah. At any rate, uh, one problem that we knew we had not settled right and that caused considerable pain was the problem of fixtures, Section 9313, uh, which was essentially modeled on uh, <coughs> the fixture provision of the Uniform Conditional Sales Act which was essentially modeled on a New York statute of 1904, uh, which for the first time, uh, instead of saying once personal property is affixed to real property and becomes real property, all personal property financing on it, it disappears. Instead of saying that, as most states said, it said that under certain circumstances that personal property financing uh, can be preserved. Uh, there were <coughs> uh, problems with it. For instance, it took for granted that the debtor in the personal property financing was the owner of the real estate to whom the goods were affixed. And yet on its face, uh, it would apply even if the debtor was a contractor who had bought the bathtubs from a supplier and executed conditional sale contracts on them and then affixed them to real estate that had no connection with the contract. So there were problems on it. Now, Coogan 
dealt with some of the defects in a 1962 article in the Harvard Law Review. Uh, Gilmore came back with a 1963 article in the Harvard Law Review, which, like Gilmore, uh, went way back to the historical foundations of this problem in Fosdick against Shawl and other ancient railroad uh, doctrines. Uh, and in 1964, I, just being a pragmatic guy, dealt with what was wrong with the Uniform Conditional Sales Act and what was wrong with the uh, 19, in the first version of 9313 and what we had to do to correct it. Uh, Schneider was furious at us for writing these articles and in 1963, the American Bar Association met in Chicago, <coughs> and at that meeting we had the first of many subsequent meetings in which a group of the code of the Article 9 specialists, Gilmore, Coogan, uh, Haydock, or Mor Malcolm, whoever else was around at the time, a referee in bankruptcy who had written some notable article on leases, <coughs> got around a table, and in each case I was the interlocutor. <coughs> no doubt because they figured it was safer to let me ask the questions than try to answer. <coughs> and we had an informal, unrehearsed, uh, <coughs> free-for-all free uh, discussion on the existing problems of Article 9. <coughs> There are at least three published <coughs> versions <coughs> of that kind of discussion. That first one is published in 19 Business Lawyer, and there are at least two others which are published as separate volumes. Uh, <coughs> and here at this session, we were picking apart flaws in the code and the Gilmore and Coogan articles and fixtures had already been written, and Schneider was furious. He summoned uh, Coogan and me to his hotel room. He would have summoned Gilmore, but Gilmore was not in Chicago at the time, and he gave us hell for making his enactment job difficult by criticizing the product he was trying to sell. Uh, and he said, I want you to stop criticizing it. So we, until we get all the states except Louisiana uh, to enact it. And <clears throat> we said, when will that be? He said, 1967. He was exactly right because by the end of 66, he had all states but, Indiana, uh, but uh, Louisiana and he kept his word. In the fall of 66, uh, uh, we began organizing uh, the uh, review committee, uh, which functioned from 67 to 71 and produced the 1972 amendments to Article 9. Now there's a bit of history there. It was we three people who were the worst offenders, and we showed our respect for Gilmore, for Schneider's view, because I published my article in 64 after that meeting, and in 66, before the review committee project was announced and organized, I wrote an article in the New York New Law Review on suggestions for revising uh, Article 9 in the intangibles field. And of course, Gilmore and Coogan had not uh, been muzzled either so when it came to picking the personnel of the review committee uh, on reflection, Schneider showed his teeth and exacted retribution. I was in Alamogordo, New Mexico, uh, <coughs> visiting uh, my son, who was a captain in the Air Force, and which had a big 
base there and had on view my first grandchild. Uh, and I got a call from Bob Browker uh, of Harvard Law School announcing that uh, they were, there was going to be a review committee. And he, Browker, was going to be the reporter. I was going to be the associate reporter. But because he, Browker, uh, was also at the same time uh, the reporter for the restatement of contracts, I would be expected to do the work and carry the ball. So I accepted that and didn't think much about it. He gave me a list of names of the ten people uh, selected uh, for the committee, which included two judges and people like Millard Rood, whom I didn't know very well, Dave Henson, whom I uh, did not know as well then as I have come to know him, uh, Harold Marsh, and there were so many potential uh, people who could be chosen that I failed to be impacted, as I should have been, by the absence of Gilmore and Coogan. I must say I just overlooked it, so I agreed with Bowker. And then I realized at some later time that Gilmore and Coogan had been omitted purposely. And on reflection, I realized that uh, I had been chosen as a reporter, but with Browker sitting over me to keep me from going wild. Uh, and so there was some to do about it. Uh, uh, some people uh, threatened, and I joined them. Uh, not to go ahead on this committee unless Gilmore and Coogan were brought in and an arrangement was made uh, to have them designated as consultants to the committee, uh, but without a vote. Uh, that was their punishment, and my punishment was to have Browker sitting over me. I don't want to dwell on that because Browker was very able. Uh, he did his <coughs> share of the work uh, if you read the 24 or so uh, working reports I wrote to the committee in preparation for meetings, you'll find that Browker seldom got around to reviewing them in time to join in them, so they are mostly under my name alone. But he was a meticulous, ultimate reviewer. Uh, he knew the style of the commissioners for drafting and enforced it vigorously on me so that it was acceptable to the commissioners. And he was a better draftsman than I. He solved some problems that I was stumbling on. So I have uh, no complaint about my interconnection with Bob Browker uh, in that uh, four years. It was an excellent experience. I'll give you a postscript to your story about Coogan and uh, Gilmore. When they weren't designated, I got together with Herb Wexler. And I said, we must have them on there in some capacity. You may recall that you, Coogan, and Grant were doing a lot of CLE programs for us at that time around the country, talking about the code. And Herb agreed that they should be on there. And working with Herb, they were made consultants. When Schneider found out that I had been instrumental and having them as consultants, he didn't speak to me for a half year. And he was absolutely furious with me. I finally went up and met with him at his office. I was, Look, and I said, Bill, I, uh, Mr. Schneider, I never called him Bill. I said, I really didn't do this to offend you as you think. Uh, I explained to them their participation in the CLE programs, their contribution, their interest. Uh, and I said, uh, I, I didn't think this project would have the legitimacy of ought to have if they weren't involved in some way. So he, he sort of softened up then and forgave me, and after that, we were friends again. As it happened, uh, Coogan, uh, who recognized how invaluable a good Article 9 was and could be in practice, uh, worked very diligently on it. I think Gilmore's mind was, was already off on other things. For one thing, he had written his book by then, and it meant an early obsoleting of his book. Uh, 
That's not quite true because his book is so penetrating as to fundamentals that even after its discussions cease to be accurate and do changes in the code, uh, his book is still a penetrating discussion with broad historical background of many of these problems. Incidentally, <coughs> uh, his book is supposed to be being updated by Professor Baker of Alabama, uh, to whom I lent some of my working papers so oh, many years ago and then recalled them. I haven't seen his book yet. Some of these books never get produced. Um, of course, Schneider was driven by this uniformity concept. To him, that was uh, the most important thing. Uh, and I noticed when he created the permanent editorial board, uniformity, uh, the large permanent editorial board, uniformity was one of the prime criterion for action that the board might take. I don't know. It, it, uh, Schneider wanted uh, these reports of the board, which are published as prefaces, basically to have uh, committees pronounce against even the slightest variation, uh, which might conform to state drafting style. Uh, and none of the rest of us were interested in that kind of thing. Uh, and on certain things like fixtures, uh, uh, we didn't see any great need for uniformity anyway. We weren't going to jeopardize the code uh, to fight for uniformity uh, as to fixtures in states uh, like Ohio and California, which had that old approach to fixtures, which said once goods are fixed to realty, uh, shuttle financing is dead as to them, because ultimately there was no way to uh, make uniform a decision of a state as to when personal property had become real property. That was going to vary in accordance with 100 years of background in each state. You had to adopt the local state law on it. And it didn't make that much difference anyway because real property law is not uniform and can never be uniform. Fixed law is part of real property law, and if we had no uniformity as the fixtures, the code would survive. So none of us got bothered by it. We were bothered by having a workable provision, and we dealt very hard, uh, we worked very hard on it. Coogan and I uh, took the lead on this. Broker more or less washed his hands except in drafting, helping me very much in drafting the solution. Coogan and I met with a joint committee of the real estate section of the American Bar Association and a committee of the American Land Title Association, the insurers, real estate insurers. We met the equivalent of at least two full weeks over a period of several weeks battling out the present uh, section 9313 and once we had it, uh, with minor exceptions, uh, people accepted it, and the states which had refused to enact 313 originally, one by one, uh, fell in line. Even California, which had long resisted it, uh, fell in line a few years ago uh, through the work of George Richter of uh, Los Angeles, uh, whose excellent work on the code has seldom been credited enough. He was a quiet person, but an effective quiet, one. Very able. Uh, George Richter and Al, uh, Al Berger of Buffalo, B-U-E-R-G-E-R. -E uh, while we were working on the code, took the lead in drafting the Uniform Certificate of Title Law, uh, which conformed to code thinking uh, long before the code had made very much progress uh, and became the first workable certificate of title law and it integrates beautifully with the code because 
those two men took the lead in drafting it. <clears throat> but you're, I remember the article, and I reviewed it, but he worked very, very hard, had a number of meetings. And I think it was chaired, as I recall, by Herb Wexler. It's chaired by Herb Wexler, who, uh, of course, was very frank, just as uh, our present chairman, what is he? Who's the chairman of the of the uh, board now? Jeff Hazard. Jeff Hazard. Just as Herb Wexler and Jeff Hazard both took the position that they didn't know anything technically about the subject. But when we were stumbling over a drafting problem, Herb Wexler was remarkably able to solve a drafting problem even though he didn't know the subject substantively. <coughs> I think he's unduly modest. He may not know his subject when they started out, but after a couple of meetings, he oh, that's right. was very conversant with it. He would start out saying, this is not something I know much about. But halfway through, he knew as much almost as anyone who was participating. Well, let's change, uh, shift gears a minute. You were also involved in another ALI project, the Federal Securities Code, a reporter for which was Louis Laws, and you were engaged as a consultant there. Well, uh, Herb Wexler refused to let me be appointed to the Federal Securities Code until we completed the uh, 1972 revisions of Article 9. And once, so they had two years jump on me, and once <clears throat> that one was wrapped up in a bundle, he let me be appointed uh, to Louis Loss's project. And I take it there were some differences there that developed? Yes. Uh, I don't think Louis Loss would mind you having you put it on the record. <clears throat> Well, as it happened, uh, Louis Loss made his project too comprehensive, uh, and thus it took too long and he missed his timing. Uh, he really had the uh, Democratic uh, Congress and a at least neutral a uh, Democratic president ready to go on the code, uh, but uh, the Democrats lost the 1980 election and that was the end of the code, as you know. Uh, of course, nobody could have foreseen that result of taking too long uh, by trying to encompass too many topics. But Louis, <coughs> Louis's great mistake was in trying to be a codifier of everything there. And I could see and I could welcome a codification of all of the disclosure sections of the several statutes, not only the 1933 and the 34 Acts, uh, but also the related disclosure sections of the of the Public Utility Holding Company Act and of the Investment Company Act uh, and the Investment Advisors Act and so on. Uh, but he insisted on also codifying the substantive provisions of those statutes. Uh, the regulation of public utility holding companies the infinitely complex and tiresome regulation of investment companies with a vast number of definitions and that kind of stuff, sticking them into this statute, uh, messing up the simple flow of disclosure and filing provisions by, by provisions about the public utility service companies and the like, many of which were dead materials by the time he got there. The so-called death sentence, the breaking up of the holding companies, was substantially complete 
long before 1980, nobody was interested in it anymore. Just paperwork to do the necessary filing. And even the SEC wanted to get out from under and at one point uh, favored either repeal of that act or in the alternative uh, letting somebody else do it. They wanted no part of it. Louis sat there insisting on codifying it all uh, and uh, did, I think, a beautiful editorial job, uh, but it lengthened the damn thing. It lengthened the time it took to present it to the layers of review uh, that he had. Uh, it involved problems that were no part of a unified disclosure code. And as I said, the result was that he lost his timing. Lou was primarily an editor uh, rather than uh, one who dealt uh, with substantive problems. I'll give at least two of these statutes, the ex Public the S Securities Exchange Act of 1934, the Securities, uh, the Public Utility Holding Act of 35, definitely, and I think also the Investment Company Act of 1980 have preliminary uh, legislative recitals, uh, the purpose of which is, is to give congressional recitals of fact to serve as the basis of the constitutionality of the statutes by mentioning problems which required federal as against state enactment. So, Louis came along 30 years, 40 years after these recitals had been written and put them together in hype verba, word for word as they had been written 40 years earlier. So I had made a practice because our meetings <coughs> sometimes were very wasteful of time while somebody argued about uh, minor points. And I determined I would never hold up a meeting uh, with minor corrections that I could deal with with correspondence with Louis. So I kept my mouth shut on his staff and I wrote Louis and I said, look, oh, Louis, if the congressional recitals of evils in 1934 and 1935 and 1940 are still in effect and can be described in the same words but today, then these statutes have obviously been totally useless. Instead of revising them, we should repeal them. So he got the point <laughs> and he dropped those recitals. But that's in some respects, the kind of uh, unduly uh, careful repetition of everything in the statutes that he did instead of judicious pruning in the process. Now, we, we, he and I had one big argument uh, in, as I said, the SEC at one point uh, wanted to repeal or get out from under the public utility holding company. At some public meeting, Joe Weiner, who was, had been uh, the director of the public utility division, and uh, other knowledgeable people in that field expressed uh, a strong view that uh, the public utility portions of this statute, of this securities code, ought to be deleted. We should limit ourselves to the disclosure material. Uh, and Louis would not hear of it. I came back and advocated that. I told Lou uh, that uh, others had advocated it publicly. He would not hear of it because he was building his monument. Uh, and uh, so he wrote around uh, who agrees with Homer that we ought to take out the utility and the investment company sections. Nobody had the courage to destroy Louis' dream by 
saying in his, to his face what they had said elsewhere. So all that stuff stayed in, and as I said, he lost his timing uh, because of the extra years <coughs> that it took. Another example was that he put in there the the provisions of the Securities Investors Protection Act, uh, which had been put in by Congress, and which is in effect a, a guarantee uh, somewhat similar to the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance, which is now plaguing us, uh, uh, to protect uh, securities investors because of the collapse of many brokerage companies in 1970 as a result of the so-called uh, back office problem. Uh, and that statute is not administered by the SEC. Uh, it's a guarantee statute rather than a regulatory statute. It doesn't tell anybody how he must run his business. It barely provides for uh, charging the companies, a premium based on some formula, uh, pooling that and uh, providing insurance for investors uh, up to a specified amount, which I think is $100,000 or maybe $300,000. Forgotten. I've forgotten between that, that insurance and the private additional insurance that some uh, brokerage firms offer. <coughs> So it had nothing proper to do with a federal securities code, but it did have the word securities in it. He was damn insistent uh, that he was going to put it in. But he didn't understand the problems at all. Actually, uh, its general counsel, whose name slips me now, and who had been an SEC lawyer, and Roberta Carmel and I uh, updated that statute for him, but he insisted on putting it in. Well, his approach of that kind, primarily an updating editorial job, uh, was, I think, uh, he did a beautiful job of that, but uh, I don't think it was the greatest job uh, in terms of uh, maximum contribution a contribution that would have cleaned out a lot of dead stuff. Uh, examining it substantively instead of just rewriting and consolidating it would have been a much greater contribution. Louis, of course, is recognized as the greatest authority of the SEC. Uh, undoubtedly makes a fortune <coughs> on his books, has just published a new edition, one in three volumes, uh, successfully. And I am a poor, struggling guy living on a pension, so who am I to criticize? <laughs> Let's get back to the, the final phase of this little interview and talk about the commercial code again. Uh, there's a process of re-examination and revision going on now. Is it worth the effort that's taking place? Uh, how, do, how do you view this uh, review process uh, there's a new Article 2A, there's a new Article 2A, there is a uh, new Article 6. Well, as, <coughs> as you know, I think we needed an Article 2A. Uh, I no longer had a vote when uh, Article 2A came before the board, but I announced that if I still had a vote, I would have voted against it. But I think we did need an Article 2A, but not that one. Uh, 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 what, were, what was wrong with it, in your view? Well, we had gone through a long history, and Carl Llewellyn fought this battle uh, in Article 9 of publicizing uh, cases of split ownership of property. He fought it on the question of uh, filing as to accounts receivable, when Milton Kupfer and his group said that if we file as to accounts receivable, we'll be out of business and uh, we can't live with it. Uh, there's, a, there's a transcript somewhere in the New York Law Revision Commission in which Grant Gilmore called Kupfer's group a lot of names for that. Uh, uh, 
And, of course, Carl was instrumental in providing for filing of conditional sales and several mortgages. Uh, way back in 1941, John Hanna wrote an article in the Columbia Law Review arguing that there was too much filing going on. And uh, Carl took the opposite position and caused the filing as to accounts receivable and authorized the filing as to <coughs> chattel paper in the code. And a lease is so close to a security interest that you have to have arbitrary uh, demarcations to separate them. And that being so, it seems to me that the simple way to avoid a lot of headache is to require filing on leases as you do for, uh, for uh, conditional sales and other security interests. Of course, <coughs> if a person rents a punch bowl and punch cups for a week for a wedding, uh, you don't want a filing there. So someone would have to work out a de minimis provision for short terms and small amounts, but that could be done. Nobody would argue very hard as to where you draw the line, but that you have leases that are so close to uh, conditional sales that you have to provide arbitrary definitions to draw the line, then say you can avoid filing by doing it in the lease form, I think it's a fundamental mistake. Now, 30 years ago, uh, there was a practice of avoiding filing on what were really sales by couching them in the form of a lease, uh, which, as to which there were then no filing rules, uh, and make sure that at the end of the lease, the lessee kept the property by writing an option on a separate piece of paper even in, either in favor of the lessee or in favor of an affiliate of the lessee, just to be sure he got the property at the end. The reason for doing it that way was that if the lease was for a fairly short term, he got uh, the deduction of his whole cost as rent, because rent is deductible, while it was frankly a sale transaction uh, with security. Uh, Instead of deducting the payments, you could only deduct depreciation. And the depreciation could be much longer than the period of payments. So that the Contractors Association published a form of lease with a separate option, uh, which was used to cheat the government on taxes. Now, that <coughs> problem ultimately was wiped out when accelerated depreciation came along and you didn't have to you could get the same deduction substantially either way. But now, if you recreate a situation in which you can avoid filing in public disclosure, with that kind of unethical device, I think you're going to see it. And I think the reason that the Contractors Association and the other SOR's associations fought so vigorously for this code and against filing was precisely that. We haven't seen it yet, but I, I would bet that you're going to see it. Well, what, what, uh, what do you think of the revision process on article by article, or do you think they ought to do the whole code at one time? I think Marty Ehrenstein has a, has a concept that the entire code ought to be done as a unit rather than separate pieces. That was Marty Ehrenstein's contention and he undoubtedly figured that uh, he might play a leading role in it. Uh, but uh, no, uh, no one else got strongly behind it because it's an awfully big project. And the needs are not uniform. Uh, obviously, uh, the sales article is ripe for revision. Grant Gilmore used to comment that uh, uh, the real problems of sales uh, were not dealt with uh, in the present sales article because the real problems of sales are in franchising and that kind of thing. And the 
code just doesn't deal with them. Uh, <clears throat> Article 6 certainly required something to be done. <clears throat> Down Rapson, after having for years contended that the best thing to do with 6 was to repeal it, uh, finally won his victory. Uh, but I asked Harris, who was the final draftsman, about it just yesterday, and he told me, so far as appears from limited exposure, that abandonment option uh, is not going to meet with favor, and apparently the new revision is not being enthusiastically received either, so I, oh, I don't know what's going to come up. But Article 6 is <coughs> comparatively unimportant and might well have been left out of the code, so it's not important. But let's see where we are. Well, uh, yeah. Article 8 uh, is important, and I, I'd like to talk about an incident there. Uh, when we had drafted uh, the revised Article 9 in 71, uh, reporters in the review committee, <coughs> we took it to uh, the then permanent editorial board, on which I think none of us sat. And on the day of the appointment, on the day of that appointment, as we sat down, we were in effect pushed out of our chairs by representatives of the American Bankers Association and the American Bar Association, who seized the opportunity of that meeting of the uh, board to say we have a national crisis in the paperwork debacle in the bank offices of the uh, brokers and bankers in the securities field, and we must immobilize or get rid of the stock certificate because someone had figured out that it takes 19 different motions to sell 100 shares of stock from one client to a broker, through his broker, to another broker, to a second client, that's the minimum. You have to have a new stock certificate prepared by a transfer agent and a registrar. Uh, and I don't know where there were 19, but there were. And the lower Manhattan was crowded with messengers running back and forth with stock certificates. So they said, we must get rid of the stock certificate. So we want you immediately to draft uh, amendments to Article 8, which will make it possible to uh, run stocks on book account. Well, it's easier said than done, of course. And you remember a famous controversy between Ehrenstein, between Coogan, who belatedly criticized it in the Harvard Law Review, and Ehrenstein, Haydick, Haydock and uh, Hill, was it? Uh, Philadelphia? Uh, I, think, uh, I, I, I know who the guy back. Hill is not quite the right name. Uh, defending the statute. Scott? Wait, Don Scott, was it? Yeah, I think it was Don Scott. It took much longer uh, than those people originally wanted. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, the need had been achieved in other ways. For one thing, part of the crisis was due to the fact <coughs> that the banks and brokers had just computerized, and the computers couldn't talk to each other. They weren't uniform. <coughs> so it was a mess. Another part of it was that, uh, that uh, there were no provisions uh, for uh, immobilizing the stock certificate. In the meantime, the depository trust company had been created so that all the nominees uh, put their stock in the depository trust company and uh, the stocks, and there is one big stock certificate and never changes hands. It's just 
the question of who holds it, who they're holding it for. They're holding for a broker who's holding it for his clients. And so now even federal uh, bills and notes are done that way, and uh, stock is done that way, and uh, Article, the Article 8 amendments have not been widely used because by the time they were drafted, <coughs> other devices came along to immobilize the stocks to make it unnecessary. But it's interesting that when uh, a crisis arose, instead of appealing to Congress, uh, they came to the code authorities as the fastest and best way uh, to get it done uh, correctly. Now we've got lots of other uh, <coughs> projects uh, that come to the code authorities primarily because the drafting of the code has been well done. And so we have Article 4A as a part of the code. <coughs> the Federal Reserve and the clearinghouses seem content with that. You've got proposals for uh, intellectual property to be drafted into the code, and in le electronic messaging, whatever that is, is part of the code. I don't even know what it is. Uh, so the code has proved itself in all these things. The code is just too big uh, to be uh, uh, revised all at once. It would take forever. It would take too, too many subcommittees which would have to be coordinated. But what it does need, even better, better done uh, than was done the first time, is some coordinator who knows the code pretty well and when you get a new article on sales or a new 4-4-A and so on. Be sure that the definitions in one are appropriately changed and if it affects two or four or nine, that the changes are coordinated. Now, Bob Broker <coughs> was the coordinator of the final article code the first time. And I don't criticize Broker. It's an enormous job. But there are some mistakes in it. Uh, we still struggle with the fact that the definition of security interest uses the term lien uh, as being a form of security interest when the code practice is to use a lien to use the term lien for judgment and not for any consensual security interest. So that was missed. <coughs> and there are other uh, that's the definition of security interest, uh, 1201 uh, 37. Uh, and that was missed, and uh, I have come across a couple other things. Oh, yeah, purchase and purchaser. Purchase is what includes one who takes by lien. Uh, our concept is that a lien is a judgment, not anything that uh, is part of what the code recognizes. That was missed. You can't criticize it. The code is just too big. <coughs> but the old mistakes uh, uh, would help us to be alert the next time around. And a lot of people are better coordinated on it now. Uh, can I tell one interesting anecdote? Absolutely. Uh, Shortly after the code was promulgated, I was at New York University. Uh, New York University had uh, two summer programs for judges, one of them for state Supreme Court judges and uh, Circuit Court of Appeals judges, another for lesser judges. Uh, <clears throat> and the code having just been adopted, uh, I was asked to speak to the senior judges uh, for an hour about this code. Of course, in one hour you couldn't begin to talk about substantive issues, 
so I talked generally about the differences in drafting style. I said, uh, <coughs> Article 9 was largely influenced by lawyers who practiced, and they wanted to get from Article 9 answers to the specific questions. Uh, Article 2 was drafted by the Llewellyns, and they favored uh, broad statements which would be interpreted by the courts. I once said in an article in 1962 in the Illinois Law Forum <coughs> that the Llewellyns were actually anti-statute. What they wanted was to reverse certain uh, directions in which the common law had been taking, give it a fresh start and with some generalities and let the courts take over from there. Ten years later, Sawyer in a lecture at the American Bar Association, at the New York State Bar Association, said that that article of mine was the only intelligent understanding as to what they had tried to do. So in this, coming back to my lecture to the judges, <coughs> in this I said, Article 2 is in broad generalities, and uh, it doesn't pin anything down to precise answers. In fact, it's worse than that, because the structure invites saying everything twice. Uh, article Part 3 of Article 2 is on formation of the contract, and Article 2 is on performance. Article obviously what the contract is and whether it's performed are two sides of the same coin. So when you say the same thing twice <coughs> in different language, there's going to be some shades of difference and it permits argument as to what the code really means. Similarly, Article Part 5 on performance and Part 6 on default are two sides of the same coin. And again, you have everything said twice in somewhat different ways, and an element of ambiguity creeps in. And again, Part 6 on default and Part 7 on remedies are two sides of the same coin. And again, everything is said twice, and you have ambiguities and minor conflicts, with the result <coughs> that you can never look to Article 2 and get a firm answer to a question. But everything is said twice in somewhat different ways. So I said, that may have been Carl Llewellyn's broad strategy, because he believed in that in commercial cases, there were usually something to be said on each side. The best thing to do was to settle them. And if he didn't give any solid answers, the cases would be settled. <laughs> so when I got through, two of the great state judges of this century, uh, Judge Schaefer of Illinois and Judge uh, Trainer of California, both came up and they gave me hell for having thrown mud at the statue of one of the great saints of American <laughs> jurisprudence. <laughs> Good story. Earlier, Professor Kripke referred to the fact that the banks were not helpful in Carl Llewellyn's code drafting. What follows is a fuller explanation of the then existing situation and the code's impact. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that Llewellyn had said that the banks told them they didn't know anything about uh, channel mortgages and that stuff because they did business only with people who came well recommended. That meant that they were dealing only with high class balance sheet risks and they were excluding two vast groups of potential credit users. One was consumers, the other was the small businessmen. Vast users of credit if they could get it. The banks reasoned that the consumer had no assets, was probably in debt, and was obviously an unsafe credit. Uh, and 
I come back to my former company, CIT, not merely because I am more familiar with them than any other, but because I genuinely believe that they were a pioneer in both of these fields. The CIT began, interestingly enough, in 1908 as a so-called accounts receivable uh, company. Uh, its founder, Henry Idelson, uh, had worked as a credit man for the Schoenberg Furniture Store, or whatever the name was, which became the May Department Store Company. The Mays and the Schoenbergs were related. <coughs> They backed Idelson in founding this company, and the Mays and the Schoenberts became the largest uh, stockholders of CIT, except uh, the, Mr. Idelson himself. <clears throat> in 1916, Idelson saw an opportunity. He dropped essentially out of the accounts receivable business, except for very large deals, and pioneered the business of extending credit to consumers on the security of automobiles being purchased on the so-called installment plan. He had the field almost to himself at first because, as I say, consumers were not balanced with credits. And for years, as late as 1948-44 when I came to the business, <coughs> people were writing articles saying, comes the depression, uh, the consumers won't be able to pay, and the automobile finance business will collapse. It was never true, and the people at CIT knew that it wasn't true because the thing had been severely tested at the very bottom of the biggest collapse, the 1933 uh, <coughs> bank holiday, when all of the banks were closed. And when I came to CIT, they told the story that when all the banks were closed, uh, consumers came to CIT's main office by the hundred with cash and pumped it down on the director's meeting table, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cash to maintain their payments when there wasn't a dollar available in any of the banks of the country. That proved that consumers would maintain uh, their accounts if they humanly could and that the big consumer asset is his job and not necessarily any balance sheet assets. A similar point uh, the CIT people saw was true of the small businessman. And somewhere toward the end of the 1920s or early in 1930s, CIT established some so-called industrial lending offices in which <coughs> began to uh, finance the purchase of machinery, machine tools, uh, road building machinery and the like, construction machinery, uh, almost any kind of hard machinery that was durable and had a resale value. Uh, and again, uh, the debtor was frequently not a balance sheet risk, but uh, CIT saw what the banks did not say that he was going to be able to pay out of the earnings of the machine being financed and out of the uh, depreciation which protected some, in, some uh, revenues from taxation. Uh, and those credits proved to be very sound. And uh, when I left CIT in the early 1960s, the original three offices, New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, had grown to well over 30 offices. And I understand that uh, in the late years, they, they had something like 50 or 60 offices. Now, why did the banks overlook uh, these huge opportunities? The banks, as I say, simply did not see that these were sound credits. And secondly, there were legal complications that the banks were not prepared to face. Uh, as to automobiles, uh, you had a vast confusion. Uh, you had no, in some states, no special rules for automobiles, and they were very mobile, and it was hard to keep track of them. In other states, you had an original 
certificate of title law, which was no good. And finally, there was an effective uniform certificate of title law, which happened to fit in very well with the code, because, as I said, it was drafted by two people who were fully familiar with the code, George R. Richter, Jr. and Alfred Berger, B-U-E-R-G-E-R. -E so that was one aspect of the law that uh, was straightened out for the banks without any help from them. Uh, the second part was the lack of uniformity in the standard uh, form of legal contract for uh, sales on the so-called installment plan, the conditional sale contract. The Uniform Conditional Sales Act was in force in only 13 or 14 states. <coughs> Some states did not recognize conditional sales. Others had enormous variations. Uh, some required acknowledgments, some required affidavits, some required witnesses, etc. CIT had gone to the trouble of working out all of those variations with a manual for uh, completion and filing and a set of forms which provided all the variations on uh, the formal requirements of the different states so that lay people could operate uh, with them. Uh, uh, similarly, when I came to it, CIT had begun to make so-called capital loans, substantial loans on the security of machinery already owned by a prospective debtor. And my first major deal and my first travel for CIT was during 1944 uh, to close a loan in, for several hundred thousand dollars made by a, by a far-sighted man who wanted to buy a hosiery machine company in Tennessee somewhere because he realized that right after the war there was going to be an enormous demand for silk stockings again and he wanted to have the plant that could produce them. And so we made a chattel mortgage loan on a huge variety of machinery. So, before long, I drew a second manual for CIT on all of the variations in chattel mortgage law in the 48 states, which was even more complicated as to the variations than the conditional sale book, which we already had. And it was in use uh, so that any of our people could make a chattel mortgage loan uh, without uh, the aid of lawyers. Now the code came along and wiped out all of these state variations and all of these complications, thus making it easy for the banks to repair their error and get into uh, these businesses, which as I have described, consisted of making possible our enormous flow of goods through <coughs> uh, financing the inventory, uh, financing the buyer, and secondly, uh, enabling the dealer to cash in the buyer's obligation so he got the cash with which he could pay off his inventory loan. Three stages. The banks were able to get into that, but there remained one obstacle, the doctrine of Benedict against Ratner. That case uh, was a United States Supreme Court case purporting to decide New York law in a bankruptcy context. New York had a 19th century doctrine uh, which said that a chattel mortgage on a stock of goods and inventory <coughs> was fraudulent as a matter of law if the lender permitted the debtor uh, to keep the proceeds of inventory as inventory was so off because it was inconsistent with the concept of lien that the debtor uh, could keep the proceeds of collateral when the collateral disappeared. Judge Brandeis in Benedict against Rantner, which is cited and discussed in uh, the comments to section 9-205 of the code, said 
The same thing holds true uh, as to accounts receivable by analogy with the uh, China mortgage doctrine in New York. If a pledgeor of accounts receivable can collect them and keep the money and exercise dominion over the money, that makes the transaction fraudulent as a security interest, as a matter of law. <coughs> now, that doctrine spread throughout the country, and the worst area for it was the New York Second Circuit area, where the cases were unusually and unreasonably strict, and uh, one reason <coughs> that they were so strict was that Judge Learned Hand <coughs> usually a great commercial lawyer and the leader of the court, said that, in his opinion, Doc, uh, Brandeis's doctrine made no sense, and therefore he could not undertake to apply it in terms of its purpose, and the, the, the cases in the Second Circuit were perfectly hideous. So, uh, the finance companies learned to deal with it, exercising dominion by requiring the proceeds of collection to go into special bank accounts, and custodians and the like. The banks never bothered to learn how to comply with it. And that, again, excluded the bank from banks from this necessary financing. Now, Carl Llewellyn proposed and did ultimately uh, abolish Benedict against Ratner by section 9205 of the code. And that, again, made it possible for the banks to re-enter this field. On a personal note, I will mention that when that proposal to wipe out Benedict against Ratner was made, uh, and before it happened, members of the finance company industry knew that I was working on the code, and they approached me and said, you block that, keep uh, Llewellyn from repealing Benedict against Ratner. If you do that, we'll never have to face bank competition and we'll have this lucrative field to ourselves. I refused and other finance lawyers who worked on the code refused to take that attitude and we took the position we were representing the public and not our industry in that respect. With Benedict against Ratner out of the way, the banks have entered this field. As a matter of fact, they entered it not so much by competing with the finance companies, but by buying the finance companies. Either, even CIT, the biggest independent finance company, is now a subsidiary of a bank. Most of the smaller ones are. Uh, the banks bought them not to get uh, the money, but to get the trained personnel. <coughs> so. As I look back on the code's simplification of uh, finance law, I see it as having done what was necessary to bring in the vastly greater resources of the banks into this enormous field of financing our enormous distribution of goods. I don't think it would have been possible without the code, and it was a very necessary thing. I have here, Homer, the uh, April 1981 issue of the uh, New York University Law Review, which I think was dedicated to you. And there's some nice essays in there in the introduction, one especially by uh, Carl, uh, by Grant Gilmore. And, uh, I want to read you uh, something he said. Uh, he said, Homer and I had often found ourselves in disagreement both on points of substance and policy and on points of drafting. The more instances than I really like to think of, I had been forced to the conclusion that Homer was right and I was wrong. I like to think that there may have been some instances in which the reverse was true. If there were such instances, Homer would be the first to acknowledge and indeed to insist on them. 
in a profession in which intellectual theft is not unknown, Homer has always been generous to a fault in giving credit to others. I think that's a great tribute. I hope you agree. Yes, I do. I'm very pleased with that. That, I think, is the nicest part of uh, that introduction. You know, the whole volume was dedicated to me, and the last two issues were a combined issue. Uh, they were a... Uh, a uh, What's the word? A uh, uh, festive. Yeah. Uh, Louis Lawson, that issue, enlarged that word. Louis Lawson wrote a very pleasant introduction uh, to it. Uh, Bob Broker, I had agreed to contribute and died just at that time. Uh, uh, in the four or five fields that I have specialized, <clears throat> Article 9, consumer credit, securities, and accounting. I guess those are those are they. Uh, there were articles by each people in each of the fields. I, I still cherish that issue. Well, I think we ought to conclude this session by my reading the last paragraph of what Grant says. Nearly 20 years ago, in the course of acknowledging my own considerable debts, considerable debts, I wrote of Homer Kripke that his comments always remind me that he has mastered the useful art of shedding the greatest light where the legal darkness is most intense. It is a useful art indeed, and Homer, in the several fields of law that have engaged his attention, has for a long time been one of its ablest practitioners. That's very nice. I think what Grant said there, I prize uh, perhaps the highest, because Frank Grant was one of the greatest intellects I ever encountered. Homer, thank you very much. Thank I thoroughly you. enjoyed this. I did too.